So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. Now, there's a lot of changes in the rooftop solar industry with electronics and batteries and racking. I, I just think back to the old days where we just had two DC wires coming down into a simple string inverter. And then module-level power electronics, we didn't really call it then, we called it microinverters, or we called them optimizers, became popular around 2010 or so. And they're the, basically the standard. But things have changed a lot because now we've got batteries, we've got additional load control features, we're controlling EV chargers and even appliances in the house. So that simple solar system has become much more powerful. Today, I'm talking about these new energy capabilities with Enphase. I'm a big fan of Enphase going back to, to believe it or not, to 2008. I still have most of the Enphase M190 microinverter still working on the roof of my house in San Francisco. It's probably time for upgraded panels, microinverters, and batteries. But that kind of leads me into introducing my guest today, Raghu Balor. Raghu's a co-founder of Enphase and the chief product officer. And I'm just thinking, Raghu, wow, it's been 16 years that you and I have been talking about microinverters, and Enphase has had amazing success over these years and successfully riding the solar coaster, which is not flattening out in any way. So let's dive right in. Why don't you give me an overview of Enphase and where things are going? Oh, thank you, Barry, and very good to see you. Yeah, you're right. We've known each other since 2008, and boy, has it been some journey <laughs> from <laughs> all the changes that have taken place. And I think it's good to acknowledge that there's probably going to be more change in the next 10 years than there has been in the last 100 years in the energy infrastructure landscape, right? And that's the business that we are in. We are here really to affect that entire energy infrastructure landscape. And yeah, we started off as a solar provider, right? But we always, Enphase in particular, always had the ambition that we were not solving a solar problem. We were solving an energy problem. And I think to a great extent, we have been generally accurate in that. That's the reason actually why we named the company Enphase Energy and not Enphase Solar. We always had a much bigger view of it. But it's probably good, you know, for some background to understand kind of our thinking. For example, you know, I, I've been in tech my entire career in different fields, including telecommunications. And one of the things that, you know, in pattern matching that you do over your life or your career realize that distributed architectures always win in the long run. And they win for cost, performance, and reliability reasons. So when we were thinking about the energy infrastructure itself, we look at the energy infrastructure with centralized generation, transmission, distribution, and the home being, you know, not much control in the home. They're just dumb receivers of electrons, right? But we knew that, you know, you're on the right side of technology history, as they say, if that infrastructure model could be torn apart and it became fully distributed, which means the home became the unit of intelligence. Then all systems are hyper-networked. And of course, there is centralized generation as well. Nobody's taking that away. But re-architecting the entire grid from the inside out, that was our grand vision. And you didn't think that, we know the technology would do that, but can the business models evolve that quickly? And we're going to talk about that more later, but yeah, I absolutely agree with you that, that just the structure of the, the energy industry has completely changed. We used to just basically have energy for lights mm -hmm. and then for heat. Now it's for vehicles and cars and the whole house, and it's really, really a transformation. It is totally transformational if you think about what's happening in, from a demand point of view, right? There's massive demand coming due to electrification of homes. And if you really think about it, an average home consumes about 30 kilowatt hours per day. Every EV consumes an additional 15. Two EVs will be another 30. A heat pump consumes about 15 kilowatt hours a day. So now here I have more than doubled my consumption. I recently read a study that said by 2035, average consumption per home in California is going to go up by 40%. This is despite all of the energy efficiency work that's been going on. 
it's going to go up by 40%. I love that. That's music to my ears because all those solar customers we installed 20 years ago or 15 years ago, they're going to upgrade and we're doing that right now. They're going to put in batteries. And when we sell to customers, we don't go in there just saying, all right, we're going to put in solar. We give them numbers for solar, for batteries. How many more panels do you need for your EV? You're thinking about a heat pump water heater. That's going to take two panels. Heat pump HVAC, based on your natural gas consumption last year, you're going to need eight panels. Do all the math and you can see how much it's going to expand. And the distribution infrastructure today simply cannot handle this increase in demand. It's because the demand is not average. We have peaky consumption. So everything from the transformer to the service entrance to the conductors, everything needs to be upgraded. I read another study that said California needs $50 billion to upgrade the distribution infrastructure. No, that study lied. PG&E said that they need to underground 10,000 miles of wire for their future need. And it's probably going up. At $4 million a mile, that's $40 billion. So the ratepayers have to pay $40 billion. Plus, they get a guaranteed rate of return of 12% a year on that asset. So that's another, you know, however that works, $4.8 billion a year for that system. So over a 10-year period, we're looking at like $100 billion. And that's not even considering the supposedly huge growth in demand for AI. I mean, they, they, Precisely. They so, you know, great point there, right? Hyperscaling is happening with data centers. And I read somewhere that a single blade server in a data center consumes about 30 kilowatt hours a day. Wow. which is as much as a home, wow. right? And so now you can see that the demand is growing at an unbelievable clip between electrification and hyperscaling for AI. And so the utilities are getting squeezed in both directions, both in front of the meter side as well as behind the meter side. And here's a little secret between just you and I, Barry. We, our industry, is really the only game in town for to solve and help them on the distribution infrastructure. No secret. That's what we've been fighting at CalSA, tooth and claw, to make sure that the utilities and the PUC and the politicians don't kill distributed yeah, energy. Recognize, but but yeah. if it takes yeah. 10 years to run a transmission line to that new solar farm, that's not sustainable. We need that power in two years. Into, and, yeah, exactly. and we can do it. Our industry can do it. Interconnection right. takes five to six years on front of the meter yeah. interconnection. It takes two to three weeks yep. in residential and small commercial. We should focus on that. Yeah. There's so much pressure that we can help relieve of the industry. But the utilities don't make money when we solve it on a distributed basis. They make money when it's solved by them. All right, but before we keep going, let's talk specifically about what Enphase has right now and how the products are positioned in the market. Yeah, again, my role is to think about today's products and think about products for the future. So when I think about all of this demand that's coming, in fact, it's here today and continuing to grow. I have to think about what is Enphase's role in that future infrastructure landscape, right? So I really think about, it has to be about energy. The home, again, going back to our old thesis where the home becomes the unit of intelligence, it's not just because you're producing energy. It's because you're producing energy, you're storing energy, and you're using your energy appropriately, as well as you're helping the grid by providing additional services beyond the home as well. So I think about a very sophisticated energy management system that's federating power flow between your solar, your batteries, your EV chargers. EV chargers are going to become EV is going to become bidirectional. We know that controlling your consumption, etc., as well as participating in things such as VPP and grid services. By the way, the way VPP is done today is very rudimentary. I think it has to be it has to become much much more sophisticated. I'll I'll uh, give you my insights on VPPs and vehicle to grid a little bit later on because I got a little bit of a different perspective after being through it. But let's keep going. Yeah. So when I think about what Enphase is doing is we started with solar, but we started with a decentralized distributed solar architecture, which is the notion of microinverters. The way we did microinverters was fundamentally different from the way people were doing it before. People were taking big box inverters and shrinking them down into small inverters and calling them microinverters. We said, no, there's something wrong with that. And so we re-architected it using digital topology, using ASICs. And so we do our own custom chip, and which is really mm-hmm. the core to our success, but it's also to drive cost, performance, reliability, et cetera. But we also built a system 
So we said, no, it's not just about microinverters. It's not about software-defined devices with full-stack software running on each microinverter. It's about having a communications infrastructure, fully bidirectional, gateway cloud. You recall, Barry, we have had that gateway device since 2000, 2008, and cloud as well, fully bidirectional. So as we saw that the energy landscape was evolving and it was truly becoming an energy problem that we were solving with the advent of batteries, et cetera, we slowly morphed what we were doing before into a platform. And just think about solar being just the first application running on that platform. Then you add batteries into that platform. You add an EV charger into that platform. The interaction with the grid is becoming very, very sophisticated. You're looking at what's happening with NEM 3.0. As I tell everybody, there's nothing NEM about NEM 3.0. It's not it's, NEM. It's, 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 an an it's an NBT, right? NEM's over. NEM's over. Yep. Yep. NEM's over. And so I think the interaction between what's happening within the home, what's happening with the grid has evolved a lot. And it's going to continue evolving a lot. We'll talk about things like flexible interconnection, et cetera. It's a really important aspect of how we're going to solve this massive onslaught of demand that's coming at us and how our industry is best positioned to solve that onslaught. And we'll talk about because I've got some ideas and insights into how technology can avoid the incumbency that we've got with the utilities, which reminds me of the the, the telephone industry and Ma Bell and the Celex versus sure. the, the general. Yep, I, I had a front row seat to, to that journey. Yep, yep. And you saw how it worked out. The yep, competitive local carriers yeah. really didn't really I like in Celex. Yeah, yep, exactly. Yep. I was the with Cummins. a company called Serent that got acquired by Cisco. Yeah. And that's what we did. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. disruptive. All right. So anything else about products that you've got right now? And so talking about what's good for consumers, what can they buy from Enphase? Right. So obviously they can buy solar, they can buy batteries, they can buy our intelligent EV chargers, the software comes with it. They can do load control. So we offer a complete energy system. What's really interesting is that the techniques that we are applying, it's turning into a massive software problem right now because you have to federate multiple disparate resources, solar, battery, EV charger, et cetera. In real time, you have to make decisions about when do I buy from the grid? When do I sell to the grid? When do I charge my battery? When do I discharge my battery? When do I charge my EV? When do I discharge my EV? So it's becoming a really complex problem and simple rule-based algorithms don't work. You have to rely on heavy optimization. And you've got AI in there. And that the amount of software that goes into systems like Enphases just reminds me of Mark Andreessen's comment that software is going to eat hardware. Yes, the hardware is really, really important, but you look at you know the number of people at Enphase that are probably working in software, You know, maybe it's one-to-one -one compared to hardware, but it's a much, much higher. No, no, it's before. actually more like two and a half to one or yeah. almost three to one. Yeah. We are a classic systems company, yeah. but even a hardware has to be very, very sophisticated. Yeah. I think this notion of software eating hardware is probably Not a little completely. overstated yeah. because you do need very specialized hardware that enables very sophisticated software. Mm -hmm. And so whenever somebody says AI ML, it's the, you know, the word du jour, it's the buzz today. You have to ask the question, what's your data source that you're gonna use for training your models? And that's the thing that Enphase has, is four and a half million homes in 150 countries, and they're all sending us production data in real time. We know exactly what's happening on the grid. We get voltage and frequency data. And about a million homes, we get more than a million homes, we get consumption data. So we train our models using that data in order to forecast production, forecast consumption. And that's how we build this really sophisticated optimization engine that's deciding when to buy, when to sell, et cetera. And now you're in a world like NBT in California or an M3.0 where the rates are completely different for buying and selling. But what we have also done is, for example, in the Netherlands and now in, in Europe, what we do, we get what are called dynamic tariffs. So we get day ahead pricing signals, mm -hmm. right? So at 11 a.m., we get a pricing sheet that says in the next 24 hours, starting at midnight, this is what your buy and sell rate is going to be. They don't send you on a piece of paper. Though. Yeah, it's, luckily, it's a, they don't so, send us so, in on a piece of paper, but that's yeah, what we get is yeah. a buy dynamic, and sell. Dynamic pricing. Da dynamic pricing, but Perry... This is where California is going, right? This is where the world is going. And in some sense, I'm actually pretty excited. It's like our industry has come of age. We are now true market participants. 
I can hear in your voice, Ragu, that you're excited. And I'm excited <laughs> about this too. So that kind of brings us up to the question with all these inputs and all this different hardware. Is Enphase kind of moving towards a closed, a relatively closed architecture to manage all these components or trying to open it up to everybody in open architecture? Yeah, it's a combination of things, right? In some cases, right, we do comply with all the standards. For example, if you look at I tw- IEEE 2030.5, you, you, yeah. you have to comply with standards. We always take the view of customer first, Mm -hmm. right? So we have to make sure we deliver the best customer experience that we can deliver. Look, we have a promoter score of, I believe, 75 or 76, right? And so it's because we really care about our customers and take care of them. I mean, everybody does, but Mm -hmm. our decision engine, how we design products so that we can make sure that the customer experience is fantastic in all aspects, everything from design, to installation. When I say customer, I include our partners, which is distribution and inst- our installer partners, as well as the homeowner. What is the best experience we, we can deliver? In some cases, things have to be closed in order to deliver that great experience. In other cases, it can be open. It's fine. It's all about the customer. Yeah. All right. So speaking of those customers, you know, there's People have choices right now. There used to be, yep. you know, it's only SMA, a couple of hers that it was, it was Solar Edge and Enphase, et cetera. Why should homeowners select an Enphase system over, you know, something else? Sure. I mean, the value proposition is very clear. Again, distributed architecture is always when you're you're buying Enphase for cost, for performance, reliability, and cost. Life. When mm-hmm. I say cost, I mean lifetime cost, right? Mm-hmm. Plus, you also have to think about future proof. Right? We are buying a 25-year asset. You're buying a financial instrument. Mm-hmm. Actually, Barry, if I remember 2009, I heard that from you. You're buying a financial mm-hmm. instrument. You're buying cash flows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. right? And when you think about it along those terms, if you want a bond that pays annuities over 25 years, you need to make sure that the face value of the bond holds its value. Why? And the way it holds its value, the equivalency of that is you need a very reliable mm-hmm. system. You need a high-performance system. You want a system that's easy to maintain. You want a system that's, of course, safe. And so you want a system onto which you can add exactly. equipment. Exactly. You is, need a system that's yeah. future-proof, yep. Yep. right? So scalability becomes important. You know, we talked about people buying EVs. I believe that every time you buy an EV, you will need an, an additional 2 kilowatts of PV and an additional 10 kilowatt hours of batteries. That's how, because the infrastructure cannot support that extra EV that's sitting on that transformer, which is already becoming overloaded. So I think you need a future-proof system. You need a software system that's bespoke but learning. So let me ask you a question, kind of moving around a little bit. If you buy that EV and you tell the utility, I'm putting in an EV, I'm going to put in a, a, a new breaker or whatever, they never say no. You can put that 40 amp breaker and you can put a new HVAC system in and it requires another 40 amp breaker. The utilities never say no. But if you say to the utility, yeah, I'm going to put in a five kilowatt solar system, yep. they can say no. Right. So they don't really give a hoot about power that you draw from them because they always know they can upgrade their infrastructure. It's more money. They make that 10% rate of return on that infrastructure. But if you're going to sell the power back, they put their foot down. And that's something that's always bugged the hell out of me. And that's <laughs> baked into the utility business model. That's how utilities make their money. And I respect that. I just hate it. Yeah. I mean, I can understand that. But I think anymore, it's becoming much more complex than that. I mean, the fact that, you know, a transformer is oversubscribed by four homes and every home can have two EVs, there's no chance that any of that infrastructure is capable of supporting all that extra demand. Now, if have three of those homes have heat pumps, well, they're well, in big trouble. So then, they have to start caring. Well, the irony is, and I remember looking at this, you know, this is like 10, 15 years ago. I remember a hot day, we were actually doing an earnings call, and the transformer blew up in our neighborhood. It's a really hot day because, you know, somebody plugged in an EV or put it, turned on their air conditioner. It wasn't there when the system was designed. Right. But you look at the ability for, let's say you've got that little, neighborhood you've got you know five people five homes they're on a one transformer they're putting in evs if just one of those homeowners puts in a solar system that offsets that demand that transformer is now running more coolly but the utility they don't make money on that they'd much rather send out a crew and go from a 20 kilowatt hour 20, 20 kilowatt, kilowatt to a 40 kilowatt 40. But, but the thing is that there is an opportunity here i think if we reframe our thinking from behind the meter to behind the transformer then what you can do is think about things like flexible interconnection and say, look, based on what the transformer loading is, if in real time, I not only know what the buy, my pricing signal is in real time, mm-hmm. but at the same time, at the physical layer, I get a signal that says, hey, this is how much you're allowed to import or export onto the grid. Being aware of what the other homes are doing that are behind the transformer, 
I can significantly defer that utility infrastructure upgrade. So that's of great value. I beg to differ. You have a perfect engineering analogy to how to do this more efficiently. Right. But when you put on your business hat of the CEO of PG&E and he sees that or she sees that, right. you know, Patty Pop, yeah. she's just saying, well, that's fine, but we would have made money by upgrading that transformer right. and now we're not going to get to make that money. So anyway, but that's just the way I look I think at from a business be, model standpoint. I think they're going to be very busy dealing with all the hyperscaling of data centers that's happening and all of the undergrounding of transmission lines that are happening. I think there is a chance for there to be some more logical discussion. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> and I think it's going to be, they're going to be forced into a technological transformation like the phone companies were when you cut your cord with the phone because now you've got a cell phone okay. and you don't have to worry about that one. But, but that kind of leads us into what do you think about VPPs, virtual power plants and vehicle to grid? And then, then we'll talk about that, but I'm going to add in my concept of vehicle to home. Yeah. I think coordination is going to help a lot. And I think about VPP as a mechanism for coordination. Now, I think the way VPP is done today is very rudimentary. It's about poking a battery and say, hey, give me electrons mm -hmm. at this appropriate time of the day. I think the more intelligent way, and it's coming, is going to be about telling the area controller. Area controller in utility parlance is that intelligent system that's managing the home that says, hey, participate in the operation of the grid and give me so many kilowatts, mm -hmm. right? How the area controller within the home decides how to deliver those kilowatts is left to the home. For example, a home may decide, I want to discharge my battery. Or a home may decide, hey, I'm going to throttle down some of my consumption. The net effect is the same, right? Mm -hmm. The home may decide someday when you have bidirectional EV chargers may say, hey, I choose to discharge my EV as another example. But that's just a capacity market. It's market participation, right? Mm -hmm. You could have frequency regulation market. You could have a reactive power market. You could have a congestion market. But these are all market participants. And picking individual devices to do a specific function is very, very limiting. And imagine doing that in a centralized manner. VPP, by definition, conjures up in my mind centralization. Forget it. Tell have virtual area controllers. Every feeder network has a virtual a piece of software that says this feeder network can participate at any point in time with so many megawatts for this duration. And then let the area controller that's managing that feeder, that virtual area controller, then decide every home, hey, how much can you participate? It becomes a statistical problem. I don't need that every home participate 100% of the time. I've really thought a lot about how to ar architect this, and it is coming. And by the way, it's likely to happen first in Europe where more of the markets are deregulated mm -hmm. than happening here because it's truly about market participation. So VPP is fine today, the way they are doing it. And we can talk about what is V2G and V2H means as well. well. That's a whole different, a whole new conversation. I'm, I'm hearing that and I'm thinking, you know, what's the mechanism by which all these participants decide what they should do? Obviously, there's going to be software, there's going to be communication protocols, there's going to be you know, terms and ways this is done, throw in AI and it's a nice buzzword. But I look at it as that the way that this is going to be coordinated is through currency through mm -hmm. money and you got to look at it i think to make this sustainable long term the money has to be in there for that consumer that has the battery that they want to hook up on a vpp and the money has to be there for the utility to say we want to borrow that battery yeah. and that's where we have a conflict right now with the vpps that i've been involved in and we just finished a test last year with the dsgs program in california great i think it was great but it just gets so complicated and when i think about from the consumer standpoint, the person that bought that battery, the person that bought the, the generating solar assets, and then you think about vehicle to grid, the person whose vehicle is going to be tapped, you know, maybe a few times a week and drained, are they getting fairly compensated for that? So a lot of the people I know, when they're talking about connecting up the VPP or using their vehicle to the grid, they're saying, well, you know, I got to drive somewhere tomorrow or I'll be damned if I'm going to, you know, get 50 cents total from the utility when it's going to drain my battery to the tune of $5 of the value of the battery. So we don't have a clear bi-directional market between the utilities that want to borrow that asset and the homes and the businesses that own that asset yeah. and want to get fair yeah. compensation. You hit the nail on the head. It has to be market pricing 
based. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm saying net billing tariff in California is coming of age of our industry. We are now active market participants. Because look at the signals they are giving us. It's in a more static form, right? Mm-hmm. They're saying, listen, I'm swimming in electrons. I go to the Kaiso website and look at real-time data on where Kaiso's generation is coming from. And usually it's 90 plus percent of it is coming from uh, renewables, right? Yep, yep. So they're saying, hey, look, in the middle of the day, it's a supply and demand issue. I'm swimming in electrons. I don't want Power your electron. Negative. Yeah, I'm going to pay you two and a half cents a kilowatt hour versus 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's time of use rate. San Diego, you're going to pay 82 cents a kilowatt hour, right? And PG&E, I think you pay 50 and a half, 54 cents a kilowatt hour. Right, and then come September, five p.m. to seven p.m., we'll pay you three dollars a kilowatt hour $2. for for participating. And, now. and when when I look at that, it's yeah. two dollars and eighty three cents average throughout those two hours. Right, but then that's in September in the evening when it's really, really hot, hot, and people are going to need big yeah. battery systems to say, "Hey, I'm going to go try and get another six dollars." Yeah, and but for that. If they don't have a big battery, say, I get the six dollars, but I'm gonna have to roast in my house, and I can't use my power. And but this that's is where intelligent software yet. comes in. Right? Yeah, intelligent yeah. software says anticipates what your demand is going to be, hourly consumption is going to be, and then it may do things like pre cooling, for yeah. example. Yeah. But what's really interesting, though, is, like I said, you hit the nail on the head. It has to be a market based pricing signal. Look at what day ahead pricing does for you. In some instances, you get negative pricing. Mm-hmm. When that negative pricing happens, if it's all about the battery, you're very myopic in what you're doing. What you may want to do, it, the reason why you're getting a negative pricing signal is because you're, the, 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 the network the is swimming in electrons, right? right? right. It's got plenty of electrons. What? So what you may do is you may actually curtail your solar because it's already green. The whole network is green. You may curtail your solar. You may charge your storage. You may charge your batteries. You may charge your EV charger. You may do some pre-cooling on your pump, etc. All of that... In our case, we have this AI-based optimization engine. It's making those decisions. It's purely a market-based decision. In fact, the way we do it is actually we treat all players within the home as market players. Mm -hmm. Solar is a seller of electrons. A battery is a buyer or seller. Uh, EV today is a buyer, can be, will become a buyer or mm-hmm. seller, right? A load is obviously a buyer. But we say, hey, what is the market clearing price? Where is the marginal cost the lowest? If you have plenty of solar, your marginal cost is going to be, of solar is going to be zero, right? Marginal cost of solar at night is infinite. So we are making these decisions in real time, but it's correct by construction. You have to be market-based pricing. But the challenge is you've got, the elephant in the room, which is the utility, which is not a market entity. They're a monopoly. They can do whatever they want. They're supposedly regulated by the CPUC. Money overcomes that regulation to a very large degree. That's why we have no more net metering. So you mentioned negative pricing of electricity in the middle of the day. You've got these huge solar farms. They're just, you know, you got to turn them off. What if we had every commercial building with everybody plugging their large EVs, 100 kilowatt hour batteries into that, soaking up that power. And that's what we're actually doing at our building here in Los Gatos. We're putting, we've got solar on the roof in, in, in another six months. We've got EV chargers. So the model is going to be for everybody here, charge your car up during the day. We'll give you free power. And then, and this is where you really start to disrupt the utility business model, drive that battery home and plug it into your end phase system. Plug it in as a generator. And when your end charge battery gets too low, islands from the grid, and now you're pulling power out of that 130 kilowatt hour vehicle. And so what you've effectively done, it's illegal based on the utility business model to have a wire going from, you know, the office to the home. That's illegal. You're not allowed to move electrons over a certain parcel. But you can drive them over. But you can drive them over. (laughs) Exactly. And so I believe... That's the easiest way for technology to overcome this stagnant, stable, very, very deep pocketed utility business model. It's just we're going to drive the electricity where we need it. The challenge, I think that it's a good idea. I think the challenge that is, is the infrastructure simply not capable of uh, supporting that today. What, for what, example, what, what infrastructure do we need? For example, I can imagine 50 EVs show up at Enphase. There are a lot of EVs at Enphase, obviously, as you can imagine. 50 EVs show up at Enphase. No way that infrastructure can support 50 EVs charging at Enphase today, even with solar, even with Enphase solar. We have a big solar system on Mm -hmm. our office building, even with solar, because air conditioners are running. We have labs. We have all of those things. I think there has to be an infrastructure upgrade. I really think that that's why I think there was a study that was done 
that showed more than 90% of all charging happens at home. But that is a fundamental flaw because charging at home is, as you said, when electricity is most expensive or infinite, whereas charging during the day when there's a surplus of electricity, that's where we need to charge. Nobody doubts that. The problem is that the utilities aren't making money on that and we don't have enough EV chargers. Now, at Enphase, when you guys have smart EV chargers that are sensitive to the demand requirements, and, you know, I drive seven miles to work, whatever. That's not that big a deal. I'll use like, you know, two kilowatt hours. But, you know, as long as people are making really long trips, maybe they only have to add in 10 or 20 kilowatt hours a day and spread that over a, a 10 hour workday, because I'm sure that's how hard people are working at Enphase. That's much more manageable. Yeah, I think you're correct. I mean, an average commute is about 40 miles, which is about 15 kilowatt hours, 15 kilowatt hours a day. I still think that the moment you concentrate that much charging in one location with labs and air conditioning mm-hmm. and all the other consumption requirements in a building like Enphase, it's very, very difficult, unless they upgrade the infrastructure. I think... I think it's an end, right? I think that should happen. Yeah, yeah, it's both. an alignment. We need to do both. Yeah, we'll have to do both. I think storage costs are coming down so much and so fast. There's an old BNEF study that was published in 2020 that said, where are storage costs going? I think storage costs are headed in a direction where I believe that every home will have 40 kilowatt hours of stationary storage because you'll have 20 kilowatt hours plus an additional 20 kilowatt hours 10 for each of your cars. And you're going to store electrons and and you're going to put them in because they're going to be so inexpensive. I have 20 kilowatt hours when I kind of look at my consumption on cold winter nights because I run the heat pump. And when I look at my consumption on really hot summer nights because I'm running the heat pump in air conditioning, I really need about 30 kilowatt hours. Yeah, and I think 40 kilowatt hours is not going to be expensive. And anyway, we are working very hard to improve the energy density. Like, for example, our next generation battery will have 40% higher energy density than what we have even with our product today. So there's a lot of work that's going on in the battery field. But it's also about software. It's also about, this is a problem of abundance. I don't want to make this a problem of, hey, I have to conserve extraordinarily. Yes, you should conserve. That should be the nature of the beast. But especially in California, we have abundance of electrons. We should enjoy (laughs) the extra electrons that we have. That is the American way. We enjoy things. We don't like to conserve. We want a bigger motor. We don't want a 98 horsepower motor. So as far as V2G is concerned, I have one concern, and I don't know the answer to this. I always think about resources having a purpose. And any resource cannot have two mission-critical purposes. The purpose of an EV is transportation. Mm -hmm. So I always worry, I have this EV, I purchased it to drive from point A to point B, right? Yes, it's got a 100 kilowatt hour battery in it. I get it. I intend to drive that EV everywhere. Should I use those electrons for driving? Or should I use some of those electrons for some other purpose? That's why I think V2G I'm open to it. I'm still open to it. I want to see what happens with V2G. I'm a big believer in definitely in V2H, particularly for resiliency purposes. I am no longer a believer in V2G. I see the way these programs are being developed. I see the way utilities are partnering with the auto manufacturers. I mean, you know, kudos to Sunrun for that deal with Ford and, you know, GM and everybody else is kind of doing the same thing. They're coming up with utility-centric programs, but they're not considering who's paying for the vehicle. And I think about, you were just talking about capacity at home. I have 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage. It works great. I have 210 kilowatt hours parked in my driveway with two vehicles. So there's always at least 50 kilowatt hours of energy in there, you know, unless I come back from a long, long trip. And it's easy for me to go to the new neighborhood supercharger or come to the office and top that thing off in a day. So when it comes to vehicle to home, that may happen faster than everybody putting 40 kilowatt hours of energy storage. And by that economic rent diminishes over time as more and more people contribute. Right. right? And it's a dual purpose battery (laughs) too. I got, I already paid for it. I might as well use it to save some money at home. And so the people that are buying the car are looking at, let's save some money, not let's save some money for the utility. They want to save some money for themselves. So that's why V to H makes a lot of sense. sense. Uh, Yeah. I think we can discuss whether, again, V to H in the context of resiliency or V to H in the context of self-consumption. I think you'll have, again, I really believe every home, you know, you're doing it with 20 kilowatt hours of battery. Remember, by definition, the batteries in cars are really not high cycling batteries typically, right? The batteries in cars tend to be low cycling, whereas if you look at our battery, LFP, 6,000 cycles, 100% 
depth of discharge. And I think it's simply a matter of time before you'll see 40 kilowatt hours per home. You know, and I think people will be like, yeah, in the event that I have some catastrophic event happening and I'm out of power for four or five days and it's in the middle of winter and I, my solar is not there to recharge my battery. Yeah, I have an extra, you say, 200 kilowatt hours sitting in my garage. I will definitely use it. But I always question this notion of two mission critical functions served it's, it's, by the same it's, resource. It's tricky. Okay. That's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks, Raghu, for joining me on this first segment, talking about Enphase on the Energy Show. Stay tuned for segment two. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. If you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at energyshow.biz and listen to the podcasts. Mm-hmm.